And then I don't know if I enjoy the music you play or watching you play, which is more exciting. Than me. <laughs> but uh, I can't imagine that instrument, which I call the sweet fox. I don't know what the official name for it is. I can't imagine that that could make an unhappy noise. That is such a wonderful sound. And you just make people happy when you play it. <laughs> and so, and uh, you know, I'm saying this to encourage people to write cards. I'm not saying this to beat anybody up, okay? So don't take this the wrong way. But I suffered an accident, probably because of my own pride. I'm pretty sure that's why it happened, but God straightened things out for me. But I've had two people from the church ask me if there's anything they could do to help me. I've received no cards from the church. I've received two cards from people that aren't even church going <laughs> and they were very encouraging and I and I, I love getting them and I'm not saying that like I said to beat anybody up I'm just saying that we should send some cards out and I should do more diligence of myself in doing that and I see I, I seem to look pretty thin today um, I know there's some parades going on I guess maybe People would rather see a parade than come to church. Me, myself, the parade I'm interested in is Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what I want to see. Now, before I get started in this sermon, I, I just got something that really... I started reading last night, early writings, and I got into the chapter, chapter 63 for all you A students that want to check out later and read it yourself. I don't know how far I'll read this, but... I do want to read a little bit of this. <clears throat> it says, I saw that Satan bade his angels lay their snares, especially for those who were looking for Christ's second appearing and keeping all the commandments of God. Satan told his angels that the churches were asleep. He would increase his power and lying wonders, and he could hold them. But he said the sect of Sabbath keepers we hate. They are continually working against us and taking from us our subjects to keep the hated law of God. It's powerful. That whole chapter is so powerful. I wish I could take the time to read it, but I won't. Uh, I hope that you will later. You said early writings, right? Early writings, yes. Page 63. Ch uh, chapter 63 covers. Page 63. Chapter. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, Y'all got this little bulletin? Mm -hmm. I picked this bulletin because of this picture. I really love this picture. What do you see in this picture? Jesus. He is at the helm, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Our commander in chief. And you see him in a little boy? Where's his eyes focused? Jesus. The, husband? the husband? Where's he focused? Jesus. The wife, she's right behind her husband, hanging on to her husband, but her eyes are focused on Jesus Christ. I don't think you could render a better picture. Could you, if you were an artist, draw what that artist is trying to portray there any better than he did? Beautiful picture. Some people see pictures and they just pay no attention to them. For me, life is nothing but pictures. The sermon title I picked today is What is the Way? What do you think of when you hear somebody say, What is the Way? Directions. Directions? What did you say? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what I'm looking for. The way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ. Okay, 2 Corinthians. Everybody got their Bible open? 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. It says, For he, who's he? Well, this is God the Father. For he, God the Father, made who? Jesus. Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. 
So he took Jesus who knew no sin and made him sin for us who knew no righteousness. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? I guess we need to ask ourselves now, what is righteousness, right? So, what is righteousness? Right standing with God. Right standing with God. Would you say that righteousness is behavior? Is it right doing? I would say... Then he exposed to sin and overcome If righteousness was was merely right doing, or righteousness was merely behavior, then would we need Jesus? Righteousness, brothers and sisters, that's it, you need, you need an absence of sin, that's correct. Righteousness is always and only comes through Jesus Christ. It only, it's with Jesus, period. There is no other way. You know, many Adventists came up through the ranks and their children were just wore out with, this is the way it's all about behavior. And when they grew up, they kind of went astray. Because they didn't grasp the fact that Jesus Christ is our righteousness. Too many people put the cart before the horse. Let's, uh, let's turn our Bibles to Romans 1. Romans 1 and 16. You're there to say amen. 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 For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So, what is this faith? The faith in Christ? The faith of Christ? How about the righteousness of Christ? We need to be not only in Christ. Christ needs to be in us. Because if he's not in us, we are right <coughs> Period. You can do all kinds of right doing. You can look as righteous as the scribes and Pharisees did in Jesus' day. And did not Jesus say, you need to do all the things that these people do? Right? Did he not say that? But he also said that they were white-washed sepulchers, didn't he? Full of dead men's bones. Why? Why were they that way? Because they put the cart before the horse, didn't they? They were worried about attaining righteousness in and of themselves. Righteousness only comes and always comes through Jesus Christ. Amen. Period. If you don't hear anything I hear else I say today, I pray that you hear that. Let's turn this one page, Romans 3. And verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. That leaves it pretty plain, doesn't it? That there's only one righteous. And that's only found in Jesus Christ. And in no other. Amen. There's a lot of religions on the world today. And they point to a lot of different things. And 
They want to make disciples of different gods. But there's only one empty sepulcher. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse chapter 3 and 20, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that we previously committed. To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. I mean, that is it, is it not? Amen. That's where the rubber meets the road. It's all about Jesus Christ. Always has been and always will be. There is no other way. The Lord says that I forgive thy sins for mine own sake in Isaiah. That is pretty remarkable and it's very deep when you stop and just chew on that for a little bit. But we're going to keep moving right along because time's just a moving. And we will go to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And verse 25. And you're all there to say amen. 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 When they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. As he spoke those words, he, as he spoke these words, many believed in him. As he spoke these, who is he speaking to? Yeah, he was. And it, what does it say there? It as he spoke these words, many believed in him. Hmm. Amazing. Amazing. Why is Jesus the way? Because there is no other. He is the only one that was sent us. <laughs> the only one that was sent us. The only righteousness of God. I mean, we read it there. The righteousness of God. You see, a lot of people think that that God the Father is this, this it's like bad cop, good cop, you know. God the Father is this big meaning that wants to just go after everybody. And Jesus is the one that has to go give a pound of flesh just to keep him calm down. You know, just settling down. But that's not it at all. When you read your Bible and you pay attention to the words that it says, it says that God the Father was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. You see that? Mm -hmm. Jesus is, he's, he's the way. Do you, you get that? Because there is no other way. The Father doesn't work any other way. 
When the Father created the world, He created it through Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus is our judge, and He is our judge. But He's our judge because the Father judges the world through Jesus Christ, which makes Him the way. Listen, if you don't have Jesus Christ, you can have everything. And you have nothing. The Bible says you will have the whole world. And if you don't have Jesus Christ, even that which you have will, will be taken from you. There is nothing in this planet that is worth losing Jesus Christ. Let us continue on 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say, You will be made free? See how hypocritical that is? I mean, what are we talking about here? Weren't they in the Roman Empire? Did they have a master? And we're not bondage to anyone? It's a pretty proud statement. Isn't it? Yeah. When they made that statement to them, think about this. They weren't actually talking about not having anybody over them like the Romans. They were, this was a spiritual conversation. Yes. Yeah. They answered him spiritually. We have Abraham as our father, and we're not bound under sin. Right, yeah. And as you said, Jesus is the way. Jesus was trying to tell them, Abraham's not going to save you from your sin. Yes. That was a hypocrisy. Amen. Amen. Very well said. He took it a step further. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Amen. Amen. Righteousness is found only and always in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to give this little illustration because I've had a lot of time to think about. It's funny because I always say the hand because it just doesn't behave me these days doesn't do anything I want to do. But the other day, evidently, I said, my hand. And my wife turned and she said, what did you say? <laughs> did you say my hand? And I said, yeah, I think I did. She says, well, things must be getting a little better then. <laughs> she's sick of me saying the hand. The stupid hand doesn't work. You know? Anyways, I want to use this illustration. And, and, and in my therapy, that I'm, I, I'm like a great big kid. I am. I'm like this, there's like this little guy in a joystick that moves his body around. I'm just, I am. I'm like a little kid. I really am. I, I have a great imagination. Um, but I, I, I play with things in my mind while I'm trying to heal his hand. You know, when, I, when I'm pulling my hand up, I imagine fire can come out of my hand. It helps me bend. It helps me forget about the pain. And I, you know, I just play around with things. Anyways, in doing this, I, I thought of this illustration. Let's imagine for a moment, just play with me here, that I have this supernatural hand. This hand is it, its like a gift from God. It's, it's something so powerful that it can grab anything and just crush it. doesn't matter what it is. It can crush it to pieces. It can stop bullets. It can go through fire. And I mean, it, you know, women like a man that could take care of them and be strong, you know, and I, and I met this gal that's going to be my, just play with me here, I met this gal that's going to be my wife, and she really likes this hand, <laughs> you know, and I'm asking myself, you know, I wonder if she really loves me, or does she love this hand, you know, and I really don't know, and i uh, we get married and we have a good life together and, and, and she decides one day that she doesn't want to be married to me anymore. She's going to just go. Well, 
if she leaves me, if she divorces me, she divorces this hand. Right? This hand doesn't go with her. This supernatural, wonderful hand is gone. You see? I know it's kind of a lame illustration, but the hand represents Jesus Christ. You see? Apart from Jesus Christ, you have no power. You have no strength. You have absolutely nothing. And if you decide for whatever reason to divorce yourself from the Lord Jesus Christ, to choose anything, whatever, other than Him and His righteousness, you lose the hand. You lose Jesus. You've lost everything. The devil is very crafty, brothers and sisters. He can trip you up and fool you. He can make you believe that everything's great, man. It's all good. Think of Solomon's temple. The beautiful temple that was ruined. And then they come back to this little teeny temple. And the old men are just crying. And the young people say, what are you talking about? This is gorgeous. It's beautiful. They have no idea. They don't know anything about what was. You see, Adventism began way back when. Right? Bright star people on fire. So many people moved, just, just left. And God, these, this one group just dug in and they held on to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord gave them this beautiful gem that we have that we call the Adventist Church. This doctrine. How far have we come? How far have we come where our colleges are now saying, well, you know, we should have gay pastors and lesbian this, that, and the other thing. It's, it's sad. It's terrible. It shows the times that we're living in, brothers and sisters. I, I want to have us go real quickly to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8. How easy it is to, to slip away. How easy it is to take your eyes off Jesus Christ, especially when you have an enemy that is so powerful that he doesn't sleep, that all he wants to do is destroy you. Hebrews 8, beginning in verse 6. But now, he has ordained a more excellent ministry, and as much as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For, it, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them. Who is them? Children of Israel. The children of Israel. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Amen. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sin and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. This is amazing. This is amazing what we're talking about here. We're talking about God's promises. God's power, right? Not our promises. That's what the new covenant's all about. It's about God's promises. It's about God's power and not our power. It's about God's law being written in our hearts and not on stone. Amen. In our hearts. 
You see, the stone is what the Jews had. It's what they they said. Oh well, we don't. You know, we know who our father is. They missed the boat. They completely missed the boat. They put the cart before the horse. It's about personal relationship. Let's turn to uh, Exodus real quick. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. You all there? Chapter 20 and verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sounds of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. They said to Moses, you speak with us, and we'll hear you. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off. But Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Do you see, I, I never hear anybody preach on this. This is about personal relationship. Do you see where the Jews went wrong? Moses was telling them, no, you need to come in. And they're saying, no, we need to go out. You go in. You take it for us. We're not getting any of that. God wanted intimacy Amen. with his people, but they didn't want it. Personal relationship. Let's go to 1 John. 1 John 2. 1 John 2. And verse 20. Are you there? Amen. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. This covenant is about submission. It's about God's power. It's about God's law. It's about personal relationship. It's about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Jesus wants to give you power. Power. Power to be victorious over this, this fierce enemy. This is not our battle. This is not our war. The only decision that we make is who we are going to serve. And when we make that decision and we settle on the Lord Jesus Christ and we stand there, we are given the power through the Holy Spirit. It's said right there, our anointing. I want you to go down to verse 21. Yes. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. In what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same